want to introduce our moderator today, Michaela Prater. She is uh, one of our CATO fellows, and I'll let her do the introductions of the panel. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, so just so you know, we're talking about plastic this uh, this morning. We're talking about rethinking plastic specifically. And I'm going to briefly introduce our panelists and uh, pose a question for them to kind of get into the meat of the conversation. But really the way we'd like to have um, this, this particular discussion is to d dig deeper and really involve all of you. So, um, you know, if you start to think or formulate questions, please write them down. <coughs> we're we're going to give a lot more time to, to have having an interactive conversation. So um, I'll first introduce Marcia Craig. She's a Global Business Director, Renewable and Sustainable Performance Palmers at DuPont. Um, we're joined with Lauren Faber, who's also a CADO Fellow, um, who's the Assistant Secretary for Climate Change at California, the California Environmental Protection Agency. And we're also joined by David de Rochard at the end there, founder of, is it Mayo? Mew. Mew. And Ron Gowen, who's also a CADO Fellow, who's a co-founder and director of Recycle Bank. So um, to get right into it, uh, I want to first ask Marcia, um, what does the idea of plastic redesign mean to you? That's a great question. And again, it's a pleasure to be here with this uh, very diverse panel. We had a great discussion already at breakfast this morning. Uh, I think it's important, before we ta start talking about what we're changing, to take a quick look back and talk about all the very positive things that plastics has brought to sustainability in our past. Uh, I, I think really any of us can't really imagine a world without plastic. Uh, you think about the things that safety of uh, bicycle helmets or seatbelt components or lightweight containers that don't shatter. And if we hadn't had advances <coughs> in plastics, the automobile engines would be so heavy we'd probably still be getting 10 to 12 miles per gallon, which was about what we got in 1970. So uh, let's look backwards, but also look forward to a couple of ways that DuPont is applying signs. Uh, I do want to clarify that my expertise and the business I'm part of is DuPont performance polymers. Uh, and so that is the area that I can most confidently speak about. It's a class of plastics. It, there's a lot of different plastics. It's a really wide range. But this is the kind of plastics that are very strong, very stiff, stand up to high temperature in very severe environments, in very durable applications, like in automotive engines, or the structural backbone of cell phones, or uh, you know things like a solar panel that you want to have out there for 15, 20, 25 years. And one of the advantages that plastics brings is it's very light in weight compared to metal. So every day our application development engineers work with other companies to help transform from metal parts to plastic parts and take significant weight out when we do that. So if it's an automobile, as you take weight out, you greatly increase the miles per gallon that you get in your fuel economy. You greatly improve the carbon emissions. You greatly improve the cost of the car for people like you and I who buy it. Uh, and just one really good example to illustrate that uh, about 20 years ago, our application development engineers worked with General Motors engineers to convert the first air intake manifold, a big part that sits on top of the engine, from aluminum to our nylon polymer in the GM 3800 V6 engine. And that was a very, very popular engine design, ran for about 14 years. And in that time, the weight savings of moving from metal to plastic resulted in about 2. million barrels of oil savings, 2. million barrels from one single component, one single engine. So just imagine what you could do with all the plastic parts and all of the automobiles and other things around the world. But enough of the past. I know you want to talk about the future, and we're doing some really exciting things there too. Uh, DuPont is applying science to renewably sourced polymers, to recycling initiatives, and just plain using less plastic in the first place. I'm going to just interject a little. So what is, for, for everyone who might not be feeling, what is renewable palm? Uh, great question. And before I started working in this area two years ago, I had the same question. Uh, when you think about plastics, typically you would use petroleum or natural gas to make the plastic from. Renewable source means we're using the waste of a plant, like a corn cob, or a non-food plant, like a castor bean, and then making that same high-performance plastic 
with performance equal to or better than the petroleum-based product, but with a much better environmental footprint. So what that means is consumers now don't have to choose between performance and environmental benefits. They can now have both. Uh, and again, a lot of people who aren't so familiar <coughs> with renewably sourced think that means biodegradable. Well, it can mean that, but it can also mean the areas that we in DuPont are focusing on, which is very durable things that stand up for a long time in aggressive environments. Uh, another area, just to quickly mention, I know everybody else wants to talk too, is the whole area of post-consumer recycling initiatives, where DuPont and the industry have spent a lot of time working. We're making great progress. Uh, in many cases, the science and the technology is there to do that very effectively with things like recycled bottles, recycled carpeting, et cetera. Uh, the thing you have to really watch out for and be careful of is just understand the whole economic viability of reclaiming and collecting <coughs> and understanding the whole environmental footprint of collecting, sorting, reformulating, stripping, et cetera, to make a usable plastic and make sure that the environmental footprint of going through all those steps is not worse than making the virgin polymer to begin with. So you have to do math. You have to do the life cycle assessment, like Dan Komen has talked about in a number of the sessions here, to really understand and convince yourself you're doing something better for the environment instead of worse for the environment. Final area that we do every day is just work with design engineers to use less plastic in the first place. Take weight out, go to less thickness, maybe use a more functional material that will be less lighter weight, ultimately less expensive in the system, and a much better carbon footprint. So I'm an optimist. I think plastics are good. I think they can get even better. Uh, but they're certainly strong contributors to sustainability. Mm -hmm. So Lauren, what, what does um, plastic redesign mean to you? Well, I think um, it's important to understand sort of where I'm coming from uh, when I approach this issue of plastics. It's certainly not part of my day job and my daily work. You know, I work on climate change and looking at um, policies specifically aimed at reducing greenhouse gas emissions in my day job um, and come to this initially through our Caddo Fellowship and looking at a, the collaborative project that we're all um, we all endeavor to, to accomplish together through our two-year fellowship. But it's really allowed me to learn a lot more about what's going on around the world and what's going on in California, where I work. Um, we are approaching the issue from an oceans protection standpoint um, and looking at sort of the, the level of plastic pollution in the ocean and understanding what kind of solutions we can um, bolster or add value to with various initiatives going on around the world. And I think um, for me, again, someone who was not very familiar with the subject starting out, what was very compelling to me um, were a number of sort of data points and statistics that I thought I would kind of put out there um, to, to frame the conversation around oceans protection. So let me use my notes on those statistics. But um, with regards to plastics, um, there's about 60 billion tons of plastics produced each year, and around 5% of that is recycled. Um, others may have differing statistics, but that's what I've, I've read so far. And 60 to 80 percent of ocean litter is from plastic uh, land-based sources. And uh, interestingly enough, um, despite, I think, a, a number of recycling initiatives around the world and even international conventions on preventing uh, ocean dumping from shipping, uh, plastic debris is increasing in, in every major ocean gyre between at least five and tenfold over the last 10 years. Um, in California alone, our ocean-dependent economy accounts for some $46 billion. And we also have had in the state a number of grocery recycling programs, for example, yet still only about 2% of plastic bags in California are recycled, at least as a few years ago. Um, so we, we really see this as a very compelling issue that not only sort of regionally are folks looking at, but this has been identified even within the UN context, context as um, a, an emerging health and environmental threat, uh, specifically plastics pollution in the ocean. 
And so we found it really timely to work on this particular issue. And it gets to the heart of, you know, how do we use plastics? What are, what are our consumption patterns? Um, what, you know, what kind of waste do we produce and what is preventable, both from the consumer standpoint and also from the producer, both upstream and downstream standpoint, and also the role of policymakers. Um, and so when I think about plastics, that's the, the, the framework that I'm using, both from uh, sort of working within the state of California and also working within the context of the Cato Fellowship, looking to, to bolster um, sustainable solutions to protect the ocean. When I look at uh, plastic design or design of any other product, I look at changing the view of consumption from linear, I buy something, I use it, I then throw it away, to cyclical. I manufacture something, someone buys it, they use it, and they then put it back into the manufacturing cycle. And we need to get companies, governments, and people to move from a linear view of consumption to a cyclical view of consumption. Uh, at the point in which I'm no longer uh, need to use this phone or uh, this glass or any product uh, that we're using today, uh, it needs to be disposed of. Uh, our perception is that that disposal is free. We just mm -hmm. throw it in the garbage can or the recycling can, our perception is free. It's actually not free. And so we need to move to a cyclical view of consumption and we also have to understand that someone has to pay for that disposal if it's not part of that cyclical view of consumption. Uh, it's either going to be government that pays or it's going to be companies that pay. And we need to get to the bottom of who's actually going to assume uh, that cost. And that's what I'm most focused on in terms of the design of plastic or any product is uh, if it's not part of that cyclical view of consumption, who's paying for its disposal. I, mean, I, I think you can even go up a level and, and fundamentally say that, that, you know, waste is inefficient design, not just necessarily plastic waste. Um, you know, and I think that's we face a huge design challenge. Um, the good news about plastic stats is you can make them up because no one really knows. That's the funny thing, right? No one really knows how much plastic we produce, where it comes from. You can read 60 billion, 100 billion, 1%, 7%, 10%. You know, it's, um, it's a lot. And the reality is we've designed something that lasts forever, and, and we use it as a throwaway single-use item. So it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out at some point these human fingerprints are going to come back and bite us. And that's exactly what's happening. Our oceans, um, you know, our landfills, um, you know, anywhere. I mean, you cannot go um, out into the natural environment and not come across a piece of plastic. I mean, who's been out on a walk recently and seen a piece of plastic? I know I have. I mean, I was walking across the garden here. Beautiful mowed lawns, and there's a plastic cup sitting in the drain. You know, it's, it's everywhere. It's ubiquitous. So it's this kind of material that I think the knee-jerk reaction from environmentalists is to say, oh, it's the devil. Let's get rid of it. We've got to ban plastic completely. Um, and, you know, let's move to different types of biodegradables and let's move to, you know, new materials, which is obviously an option, but, you know, take heed because obviously there's a lot of, um, a lot of learning to, to go with those new materials, um, those so-called biodegradables and oxydegradable materials. I think we have to get back to basically separating out the issue into what I call dumb single-use plastics, plastics that are just being used to, to throw out, as you talk about, cradle to grave. Um, and, and really say we need to either eliminate some of those completely uh, today. It's amazing to me that we can sit here today and be debating as an intellectual room whether we use a plastic bag or not. Like, is that really the best use of our minds? You know, the ACC is spending 10 million bucks a year, you know, creating a campaign called, you know, Stop the Bag Police. It's going to ruin our economy if we get rid of the plastic bag. Come on, give me a break, right? So, like, you know, there are those dumb single-use plastics we have to eliminate. And we have to take control of that really fast because we are seeing, obviously, a huge impact on marine life. And the story that hasn't been told yet is the transference of toxins in our, in our food chain through plastics in the ocean. That is only at the very early stages. No one really is even discussing that. So I think we have a totally solvable um, situation. I, I agree down the end. Plastics used in, 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 in multiple um, life cycle um, types of um, applications of you know, wonder material. Um, we've also got to think that it was 1907 that Leo Hendrik Bakelin first introduced the first fully synthetic plastic, Bakelite. And ever since that point, in 1907, you know, it was 1979, plastic production overtook steel production. But ever since that point, every bit of plastic that's ever been produced is somewhere on our planet. We're on Spaceship Earth. Nothing leaves. You know, it's here. And it's either going to be in our oceans, land, or our stomachs, unless we do something about it. So it's totally solvable. It'd be awesome if next year there wasn't even this conversation because we'd sorted it out. But, and we can. 
So to that point, you know, it seems like there re there's a reoccurring thing about the infrastructure, you know, to move away from our current linear way um, to stop continuing single use products. So what's the infrastructure that you think would be necessary to create that paradigm shift? Anyone on the panel? Yeah. I'll start and then yeah. anybody else. Uh, it really is not any one single entity. You know, I think this is a challenge and, op and an opportunity that all of us have to work together on. You know, from each of us as a consumer not throwing that plastic bottle or that cup or whatever down on the ground so it makes its way into the groundwater and the ocean. Uh, the, uh, there needs to be more infrastructure around recovery and recycle. Uh, there needs to be more of us in industry doing work to use that appropriately to make it into a usable product in the second use. So reduce what we use, re recycle, and ultimately, you know, recover energy value if, if that's the right step at the end of life. Well, I, I mean, I would just add that, you know, I think there are a few kind of easy wins or sort of you know, if you step back and think, why, why is this happening? You know, why are plastic bags in grocery stores free? I, you know, I, I don't really understand that. So, so, you know, there are simple kinds of questions where why can't you kind of build in full cost accounting and, and price appropriately and sort of who has to take on that role? Is that, is that for policymakers to look at and what are some of the um, obstacles to doing so? And also on, on packaging and kind of what, what kind of incentives can be put in place to reduce packaging itself. We were talking this morning and I was saying, I've never understood why I need scissors to open a package of scissors. Uh, you know, wh why does it have to be, you know, so strong? Um, and what kinds of incentives can be put in place so that producers um, are thinking more about that kind of packaging and why it actually benefits them to reduce packaging? Um, and so I think, you know, that's part of the story, and I'm sure Sir Ron has a lot to add on that subject. There's a... The the current infrastructure that exists in the United States is there's things called material recovery facilities. So whatever you recycle today, it's going to go to what's called a material recycl recycling facility. What's important about that from an economic perspective is if you don't recycle that paper, plastic, glass, tin, aluminum, it's dri being driven usually far away to some landfill. That material recovery facility is going to be located within your city generally, so it's creating local jobs. In terms of the revenue that that material recycling facility can generate has to do with the value of that commodity that the market is willing to pay. Now, for plastic ones and twos, there's a really healthy market. For plastic five, there isn't a healthy market. So it usually goes from the recycling facility to a landfill. It's not the recycling facility's fault. They need a market to sell it to. The person who is responsible for creating that market is the company that's putting that number five plastic out there and is not taking responsibility for buying that plastic back from the recycling facility and reusing it. Just a good example, we're talking about the caps on your, sha on your uh, shampoo bottles. Other thing on incentives that would drive this market significantly, an interesting thing about the U.S. economy is incentives have been used very successfully. So we think home ownership in the United States is very important. So you can write the interest off of your mortgage. We think saving for retirement is important so you can save a certain amount of money tax-free. We've used incentives in our economy very effectively. Here's one idea as an uh, incentive to drive demand for recycled product. If your product has 60% plus recycled content in it, there's no sales tax on it. That would force companies to go to recycling facilities and demand a greater amount of recycled product. It would uh, force them to promote and fund municipal recycling programs because they would need that supply because the more recycled plastic they could put in their product, the closer they could get to 60% or 80% and not have to pay uh, a sales tax. Now, the government would be losing some revenue from the sales tax side, but they would be saving a significant amount of money because there'd be less product going to uh, landfill, the recycling facilities would grow, which creates uh, a payroll tax. So just one quick example of how you could use incentives to, again, close this loop. Yeah, and, and to, to build off that, I mean, I, I think what we're seeing is, um, or just to emphasize what you're saying, is it's, a, it's a value exchange. You know, we look at plastic as valueless. You know, it's, it's, it's really seen as a throwaway, disposable, cheap item. And so I think we need to start retelling the story. I mean, you know, diamonds is a great analogy. It's controlled by a few companies. It's commonly found, and it's controlled by a few companies, and the market is, you know, um, basically manufactured. Um, there was a fantastic um, advertising PR campaign in the 30s to say that, it, you know, it was the symbol of eternity, and 
Um, you know, that this, because it lasted forever, so would your relationship, and you should buy one for your wife. So it became this valuable, this valuable story of, of, and value exchange. And it was a beautiful story, um, but everyone also knows that, you know, plastic is also controlled by a few companies. It is, um, you know, lasts forever. Um, and um, the story, <laughs> all the women in the room are saying, is he advocating plastic engagement rings? I am. <laughs> all the men are like, yay. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, the idea is that the value exchange um, is, is that it's valueless. And so I think what we have to do is unlock the infinite potential of plastic. You look in an aluminum can um, and, and, and you realize, you know, if you build a plane, you know, you could build a skyscraper, we could, you know, build anything. It's infinite potential. So is plastic. So why is it still seen as valueless? Because the machines that are being made to make the stuff, a lot of it for packaging and, you know, I'm talking about the sort of cheap single-use stuff now, the, you know, the polyethylene bags and, you know, those machines need to churn. They need to run huge volumes. You can't stop them. So it's in the interest of the industry to just wrap everything they can. It's like just swallowing up everything. So I think, you know, to change this, we have to sort of, you know, get back into value exchange, get back into the, unlocking the infinite potential of, of the material, stop looking at it as a valueless resource, have some transparency. The one thing you mentioned, you threw out numbers. It's like, you know, three, ones, fives. We've, we've all seen them. You know, like, what do they really mean? You know, I'd say from a, an education standpoint, they were really just markers introduced in the late 80s by the plastics industry to basically say this is one type of plastic or another. In other words, it's like this is wood, this is copper, this is aluminium, this is plastic. They're just to sort. doesn't necessarily mean they're recyclable. That little triangle, if you were to take that triangle off the bottom and put it onto the label, it'd be false information because people presumed that it was actually recyclable or recycled. And that's not entirely true. So we have to start really being careful with how we speak about this stuff and how we start to have that value exchange. I think that's really important. So education at the most prime level that's, you know, independently authored. I think it's also getting back to something Lauren said. It's important to use plastic in the right way in the right place. And you referred to the scissors packaging that's so hard we can't get into it. And that's obviously probably not the best use. Uh, but we've talked a lot this week about feeding the world and what do we do in 2050 with 9 billion people. And uh, proper packaging of food helps preserve that food for the life it takes to, to get on a boat and go from point A to point B. So, you know, we have to look at the positives, we have to look at the negatives, use the right thing in the right place, and be smarter about the overall equation. Yeah, can I uh, touch on something, David? Yeah. David, I think, bring up something important that got also discussed in our lunch yesterday, which is the value side of the conversation. And I think we need to change the nomenclature to get to a solution. So today, when we throw something away, we say, I'm throwing it in the garbage, or this is garbage. And as long as you call something garbage, people won't recognize the value in it. We think in terms of our own language construct. But if you look at it as a resource, then you can start to change people's behaviors and attitudes. So if you say to somebody, this is garbage, their initial reaction is, i got to throw it away. But if you say to somebody, this is a resource, then they're not going to want to throw it away, and they're going to ask you, what can they do with it? And so we need to change the conversation around the end use of product from garbage to resource. And if there is no value to that resource, then we need to go back to the beginning of the chain and ask, well, why was someone manufacturing something that was going into uh, our economy that had no value to it at the end? And if they do want to produce that and put that into uh, our economic system, that's their prerogative. But if there's no value to it at the end of the life cycle, they need to pay for the disposal of it. Uh, and then you'd see a quick elimination of that. But we need to change the, the nomenclature from garbage to, to resource. Well, and I just want to add to that and sort of over the course of the last few days, um, at least the sessions I've been in, you know, we've been talking a lot about sort of changing consumer behavior and that impact versus sort of large scale, either private sector or, you know, international policy change and sort of where can you have the, the biggest impact and is consumer behavior too slow um, to change when you're talking about urgent environmental calamities potentially. Um, and so I think this is a classic case of you know how do you you tackle the different areas how do you have the best impact and if you really want to change consumer behavior you know how do you structure education in a way that isn't a very slow process over time over generations versus is it is it about changing incentive structures just you know at at the cashier's uh 
counter or sort of, you know, where, where do you do it where you have an immediate impact as opposed to teaching it in schools where there's absolutely we should be doing that, but it's, it's a longer term process. It's kind of a, a collaboration of you have some policy, you've got a lot of companies out there, you know, you can read in the news about Coca-Cola or Pepsi mm-hmm. or P&G or Toyota or General Motors or others uh, putting bold statements of using recycle-based materials or renewably sourced materials. Uh, major retailers, Walmart and many others, who are driving the supply chains to do just this. The plastics industry, uh, through American uh, Chemistry Council and other associations, all aiming towards the same goal. And I think if we do that with many different uh, people coming from different perspectives, we're going to come to the best overall solution. You know, I want to sort of build on that a little bit, but also sort of think that we need to be real about this. I mean, the ACC is spending $10 million a year pushing the plastic back. Like, let's be real about that. Let's be honest. Coca-Cola, I love the fact that you're using plant bottles, but 10 million plant bottles is like not even 10 seconds worth of production. Right? Let's start being real. Come on, guys. Like, you honestly, transparency, man. I mean, to get to big steps. But you it? do. Of course you do. And I totally agree. But let's have some choice editing. We can take some of this stuff offline today. We don't need plastic bags. We don't need styrofoam cups and containers. It's blocking landfill. It's, you know, if you're a turtle and you're swimming around in the ocean, no one teaches you at school... At turtle school, the difference between a plastic bag and a jellyfish, they look the same, right? Seven out of seven turtles are now on the endangered species list because they're swallowing plastic bags. And we're seeing so much headwind coming from industry who's basically hanging on to an old model. They will lose. It will be, it's, it's like, but do you want to be progressive and say, look, if you make plastic bags, why not just change the material? You've got the distribution set up, make a recyclable bag. It's like if you're an oil company, we, why not change and just, you know what, you're distributing liquid, become the biggest transporter of water in the world. So I think we just have to start thinking smarter and being realistic and honest and say, all right, let's just tick a few of these off the list. Let's innovate in materials, but let's just tick a few of these off the list and stop fooling ourselves because we're the ones who lose out and so, so does nature. And I mean, I would just say that... I- you know, in, in the context of thinking about alternatives, we have to be very careful that we're not creating other unintended consequences when we, you know, when we move to other alternatives, whether that's the resources used, the energy inputs, yes, the ability for those to be recycled in and of themselves. So, you know, it, it's not always the case where alternatives are immediately available that solve every problem that you're trying to solve by banning the bag or, or whatever, what have you. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of misinformation. I mean, you know, especially th- these things here. You know, I mean, everyone goes, yeah, I'm using greenware and it's awesome and it's definitely a step. And I'm, listen, I'm not anti, you know, steps and companies making bold moves and, and don't get me wrong, but I think we need to be real about stuff. I think we can't introduce stuff that just doesn't have a home, right? I mean, this is only useful if there's an industrial composter, right, which there really isn't anywhere. Very few. It's got to have the right anaerobic environment. You take this and you plant it in your garden, it's still going to be there in 45 days. And the idea of biodegradable plastics is also a joke. You're chucking an additive in there and you're saying it's going to break down in 80 years instead of 100. Come on, let's get real again, right? So we just, I agree with you. We've got to be smart about this and, and we're not. And it's kind of crazy because this is kind of like a really simple issue to solve. And how awesome would it be just to wipe this issue off the planet right now? This, this whole conference, if they just stopped everything and said, we want to get rid of plastic and it's I, hats off and it's on my head to the Cato um, fellows and everything because you guys are just, you know, you, you can do it. But you just do it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, really do it. Don't just sit around and talk about it. If you're talking about this next year, you failed. And as a plastics right? industry person... I'm not in it, so I'm, the pressure's on you guys. We can just sit down, wah, wah, wah. We can just get rid of plastic, but just at, do it. As right? a plastics industry person, <laughs> you say, let's get rid of plastic. Uh, you know, plastic covers a wide range. So let's talk about the places that we need to continue and strengthen and the places maybe we need to redirect. Yeah, and, and, uh, and your and leadership would be awesome. I mean, like, if you stand up and say, look, we're all for smart plastics, but we're also against dumb plastics, that'd be a bold move. Well, I think to, to build on that, I mean, that's one one of the reoccurring themes is like, how do we in, um, create the relationships with the business sector so that it's in they, they see it in value and it becomes their mission and vision to switch, 
right? And ha- ha- what are the barriers to that? You know, I, I really want to get because that, that's if we're not going to be talking about this next year, and I hope we're not. Um, there's a lot of work to do in the next year, and and we, you know, one of the I think reoccurring tensions we've had in just figuring out what area to focus on was the strategy because we have all different perspectives and all different ideas, whether it's just policy, whether it's just people, whether it's business, and it's going to take the, all of that. So, where should we start? <laughs> I think the, the ideal start is the conversation. Right. You, know, you get a lot of different people with different ideas at the table to talk about creative ways to resolve this. Uh, and then it starts with, you know, you and I as a consumer changing our consumer habits. Uh, did anybody here uh, take the bottle that uh, people gave us uh, when we checked in this week and carried around all week instead of using these uh, biodegradable cups? Uh, I'm admitting I don't have it in my bag today full of water. So again, that's one step every individual can take. And then again, as the infrastructure is there to reclaim more, and the science is there to transform that into something that is usable to put back in a cell phone, or back in a car, or back in a cup, or back in something, uh, we, we will make tremendous progress, and we already have. Uh, but more work, of course, has to be done. I, I think in terms of change, you can you can create a pyramid of change in terms of how quickly it happens. At the top of that pyramid is pure leadership by people in power. So if a CEO of a company or a major elected official decides, I'm going to commit myself to changing the way we're currently doing things, that's the way change happens the fastest. And you have great examples of that. I think you brought up the example of Puma. I think Lee Scott did a little bit of that at Walmart. There, I, I think Yvonne Chouinard is probably the best example of that at Patagonia. But the fastest way that happens is by a CEO or a elected official saying, we're going to change it. But then you go down the pyramid, and there's other ways that it can happen. Uh, you can have environmental groups that, uh, on one side, can create massive protests. On another side, they can sit down at the table and try and work with these companies, and you see both of that going on. You can have uh, consumer reaction, and you saw that with uh, labor practices in the 80s and 90s. And so there's multiple ways that change can happen. Uh, but I think what we need to strive for is to reach for the top of that pyramid, because that's where it happens fastest, and try and find those leaders in business who have the ability to say, I'm going to change the way my company is doing business. And it's not going to be a 2050 initiative. right? It's going to be a 2012 initiative or it's going to be a 2015 initiative. And I'm going to be here to see it all the way through. And I think we need to find those uh, people in, in business and, and give them the support and, and the answers that they need. But there's multiple ways that change happens. We can all be part of that, whether it's our own consumption behavior, uh, talking to the stores that we shop at, uh, talking to our own elected officials. So there's multiple places along that pyramid where, where change happens. But the biggest, most effective change is a CEO hearing what you're basically saying, which is like, get real. Stop it with like why you can't do it, what the problems are, and just re-engineer your company and, and make it happen, and, and you'll probably win that way. Coca-Cola fights something called the bottle bill, which is an, actually an outdated way to promote recycling. Unfortunately, they don't necessarily always come up with the alternative solution, right? Instead, they lobby against it. They'll spend something like $900 million this year na- nationwide fighting the bottle bill, which as an environmentalist and as a proponent of recycling, will tell you the bottle bill is not the best solution for recycling. What they should be doing is taking that $900 million and going out and saying, how do we actually promote recycling and solve this problem? Because that money every year would actually make a huge, huge, massive dent in this issue. Uh, and so there's a lot of entrenched interest pushing back. But it takes, you know, Mutar Kennett, Coca-Cola, uh, who's done a lot of good and deserves a lot of credit. But it takes Mutar standing up and saying, I've done a lot in this area. Now I'm going to become the leader in this area. And then you actually see the change. I totally agree with you. And I, I think it does come back again to this sort of choice editing, you know, and, and on, on all levels, right? I mean, leadership, obviously, and then consumers and, 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 and or, you know, citizens of the planet, as it were, and then, and then, you know, the businesses all have to have that synergy, have to work together. But I think what we could do is we could very quickly make a kind of a list of things, the low-hanging fruit, that we could eliminate pretty quickly. And there's, you know, and, and that literally is a couple of roundtable discussions and, and, and saying, these, these five items or these ten items we can do without. 
pretty much there's alternatives, there's an infrastructure in place, there's reclamation you know, process in place for this product, or there's a, you know, an alternative material use. You know, there's a really smart way of, of kind of eliminating it without you know, too, disruption, too much disruption to the system. Because I think what happens is we, you know, we're, we're scared of what we don't know. You know, we work, you know, it's, it's a bad matter of learning, unlearning, and relearning. You know, that's what it's all about. And, and being afraid is, and, and being a CEO, when you, when you grow up and you stop to dream, you stop asking questions, and the corporate structure puts this thing around you where you go, oh, I don't want to make mistakes, and I'm bound by my corporate governance to make maximized profits. And most of this stuff means we have to jump over, and we're going to have to make some, a couple of years of loss, potentially, on a system before it can start to make profit. And that's really scary in an economic downturn. So what we do is we just stick our heels in and we stick with it. So I think we have to be brave and I think we have to create tax incentives, leaders in government and create tax incentives for businesses to take those steps, to see that there's an economy there, to see, you know, we've been, you've seen it with, you know, carbon credits. We're still fighting on, is the market real? Where does it go? How does, you know, like if there were some leaders to create the marketplace, you know, for, you know, to take these initiatives into real practice, we would see businesses follow. I have no doubt about that, but we have to, come back to you and me. It's you and me. We vote in the leaders, we buy the products, we support the businesses. So I would say the biggest power lies with us. It's our ability to choice edit companies and products and services that don't make sense. I think the one thing I would add to that, and I think you made a lot of great points, uh, we need to assess and just do the real life cycle assessment to make sure that whatever we replace what we take away with is better for the environment than what was there in the first place. I totally agree. Lower energy usage, lower greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, DuPont doesn't sell plastic goes into uh, plastic bags, so I'm not an expert in that. Uh, I've heard uh, if you use a paper bag instead of a plastic bag, you actually use more energy to produce that paper bag than the plastic bag. Well, that's probably not an acceptable trade-off either. So you need to thoughtfully think through how do you replace what you're doing in a better and more environmentally friendly way. There's no doubt we, we have an impact, whatever we do. And it's just, you know, 100% getting smarter with those, those studies and making sure that they are as, as truly independently, you know, based as possible. You know, that's important. And I think the, the other part of that... In terms of the whole assessment, it's also the human impact, right? Mm -hmm. It's our health impact and the ecosystem, right? That's, so that's an that, overall part. You know, looking at materials and what their life cycle after what goes into their creation, but also how, how long do they stay with us and yeah, in we, us? We are exposing ourselves to so many chemicals and every single day. Exactly. I mean, sorry. just to give everybody an example about a, a leader who uh, makes a decision, follows through with it, and actually changes the way a city operates. It's related to to environment. Is uh, ten years ago, you could smoke in a building in New York City. You could smoke in a bar in New York City. Uh, today, because really Bloomberg, and it was just because it was important to him. There was nobody really lobbying Bloomberg. He just this was an important issue to him. You can't smoke in New York City. You can't even smoke in the park in New York City. You're not allowed to smoke in the park in New York City. Uh, it's just one elected official mm -hmm. who took on a cause that. People lobbied against vociferously. The business community did not want to see this come into play. He did not have a massive amount of support for this, interestingly. And as an elected official, he thought that this was the best thing to do for the citizens of New York. And against a lot of pressure, it took him eight years. You can't smoke in the city of New York anymore, anywhere. Uh, so it's just a good example of an elected official saying, this is what I believe in, and I am going to make this happen, and we're going to create a, a cultural shift. And there's probably 10, 15, 20 examples of elected leaders around the world who take on a major issue, really believe in it, and follow through. And there's examples of, of CEOs. The reason I bring that up is oftentimes when we meet uh, well-respected, renowned CEOs or really well-respected uh, elected officials, we get a little googly-eyed. We go up, we say, how are you? Oh, this is great to meet you. Can I take my picture? with you. What I encourage all of you to do is, while you're doing that, whisper in their ear, I really appreciate this thing that you're pursuing, or this is an issue that's really important to me. What are you doing about it? Don't get googly-eyed in front of big-time CEOs or big-time elected officials. Uh, you buy their product, you pay their salary, or you vote for them to be in office. They actually work for you, believe it or not, and tell them what you think, and you'd be surprised at what their reaction is and how accepting they are to actually hear uh, the truth, because they're often surrounded by either yes people or people telling them all the reasons why they can't do something. And you can have an actual massive impact by when you get in front of those people, actually having the courage to just confront them and, and have a conversation. So just to build quickly, I know just on the chemical thing, what I was going to say is that you know this is a conversation that hasn't been discussed really. 
And I was saying, you know, we expose ourselves already to thousands of chemicals every day, whether we like it or not. And as I was saying, plastic photodegrades, it basically gets smaller and smaller, and it's working its way into the food system. And this now becomes a much more emotional story. Who in the room eats fish? Meat? Anyone? Right. Anyone not eat? <laughs> a few of you didn't put your hands up. But, right, I mean, basically, if you're eating fish or you're eating meat because meat is fed on fish meal, you know, you're effectively exposing yourselves to lots more chemicals. And this is it's so early on, so early on. And think about it. Why are we wrapping? I saw the other day, you know, not to name companies, but Del Monte, wrapping a banana in biodegradable packaging. Like, a banana is the best packaging that nature can give you. It's like, and we're going to go and, oh, we're going to make it better, right? And then we're going to get, you know, a pat on the back for doing it in green packaging. That's how absurd it is. So think about the health issue, and that's where the story could become a lot more emotional. If you're trying to sell in change on especially single-use plastics, the health issue is a massive, massive area. Because nobody, it's like, what's in it for me? Recycling is a dustbin. It goes in. Like you said, it's garbage. It's a way. It always is. We all do it. We put it in. If you're slightly smugger, you recycle. I've done my bit, you know, and then you walk off. And, but it's, you know, we've got to start looking at the health implications massively. We're going to take questions. Folks. So we're going to start right here. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you all very much for your leadership. My name is Ali Rogers. I'm the director of the Green the Capital Office at the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, <clears throat> so four years ago, we started... Um, a uh, composting program, um, totally switched all of our um, products in the cafeteria to the greenware and other items, um, created a compostable water bottle. Obviously, that is not the end game. We would love to go to reusables. We just have so many visitors, um, so we're working our way there. <clears throat> Unfortunately, um, the way that this works, it costs us money. Now, I want to make sure that everyone knows we're not using appropriated taxpayer dollars. Um, <laughs> It all comes from the profits that the house makes from the, the cafeterias. Um, uh, as some of you probably know, several months ago, um, the new leadership of the house decided um, to uh, switch. Uh, so we're now going back to plastics and styrofoams. It's obviously much more um, cost effective depending on how you do your economics. Um, you know, Speaker Boehner was tweeting, plastic is back. Um, and so. You know, I, I was wishing that we could find a cost-effective solution. Unfortunately, when you, you bring in the labor, you bring in the increased trucking to the composting facility, um, you bring in the, the markup. You know, these products are significantly more expensive than the plastics and the styrofoams. So my question to you is um, twofold. How do we push the market forward so that we're not bound by this first level um, of economics? And second, what advice do you have um, for me and our office right now um, in this position of this really partisan fight that we have of the plastics versus um, better, better solutions? Uh, my, my guess is that one is I, I, I commend you for what you did when you tried to get everything changed over, so I think that's great. My guess is without having a complete view into what you're doing is that there's probably not a full cost accounting going on. So in the Washington, D.C. area, you're paying between $70 and $80 a ton for disposal at landfill. So you're looking at uh, how much does it cost me to buy these products. What you're not looking at is how much are the haulers charging us to dispose of these products. And if you went to your hauler and said, and, and people pay for cardboard and paper and plastic in the Washington, D.C. area. And if you went to your hauler and said, I want you to give me a full cost accounting. If I filled your truck with recyclables, how much are you paying me? If I fill your truck with garbage, right, how much are you charging me? And that needs to go into the full cost accounting of operating your cafeteria. It's not just how much does it cost me to buy all the products from my cafeteria. It also goes into how much does it cost me to dispose of all the stuff that's coming out of the cafeteria. And I bet you if you put that together, uh, you'd actually uh, have something that's potentially workable. Because the cost of disposal in the Washington, D.C. area is pretty expensive. And landfills hate styrofoam. You've got to remember, they get paid by volume. So the truck's full. And it weighs nothing, right? <laughs> and, and most of the landfills now, it's all airspace. So they can only build up so high before they shut the landfill down. So they hate it. So they'll be on your side. You should go and get the haulers and those guys because they don't want to be hauling stuff that's valueless and, and yeah. is garbage. Yeah, and so then when you when you get that full cost, cost accounting numbers, have someone, a friend of yours, leak it to the Washington Post. <laughs> <laughs> the Washington Post is actually uh, a 50-50 partner with a large recycling facility in the Washington, D.C. area. They got into it about 20 years ago uh, because they wanted to recycle paper. So 
I can uh, afterwards I'll tell you who that is, and uh, <laughs> you can they'd be happy to you know, put that on the front page. So. I would just almost add to, um, even though I'm in the moderator role, the, the health issue. I think that is a way to win over kind of the, you know, it's no longer plastic is my health and my well-being, and that might be a stronger motivator for some folks. Actually, styrofoam, I mean, it's benzene and styrene, and, you know, there's huge leaching that goes in, especially in takeaway foods. I mean, next time you have a bowl of pasta or something in a, or a takeaway, and look at the ring that's left, yeah. right, and the high-fat foods. And so that's the issue. And also, you know, it is scale, right? So it's like, you know, it is finding leaders who are willing to stand out front and break new ground and wait for people to, you know, to come together so that, you know, the scale is what's going to change this, you know, obviously. I mean, that's an obvious thing to say. Yeah, and I think there's a couple things you can do, even if you try to work more with the city to, to scale up some of the procurement, um, which you may already be doing. But, you know, ironically, there's a huge role for policymakers in changing the incentive structure. So, um, you know, there's there's a conversation that can be had there. On the health issue, this has been something I've really been interested in on, with regards to sort of changing hearts and minds and how you really do impact people at home. Um, but you have to be honest about the data and information that this is an emerging area area of science, just as a caution. All right, so David, um, you, you're admonishing us to be real, okay? But the way the panel is presenting this thing is it, it's, it's, it's not real. Um, there's a good case to be made that plastics saved American forests. We all ran around getting paper bags and cardboard boxes and wrapping stuff up, and we had the number of people we have today and the consumption rate we have today. We probably wouldn't have 170 million acres of federal forested lands. The number one growth of bottled water in the world is in Pakistan. Pakistan. And it's there because people can't get clean water any other way. Now, what's the solution to that? Obvious solution is build pipes, build toilets, set up infrastructure so that you get it right. Absolutely. But this is a government where only 5% of the people at best pay taxes. So if you want to solve, if you want to save people's lives, literally save people's lives in Pakistan, there is not a good alternative except having really light, really cheap plastic bottles. That's why it's growing in Pakistan, not because people you know, can afford... Fiji water. And then you come to this town and you start looking around at what the high brand water is and people are using. You know, that's where you go mad about it, right? So in some ways, the campaigns that you want to lead to get people to get real, you ought to really focus on stuff that will terribly embarrass people about their use of plastics as a way of reminding them their impact on the earth. But the thing about plastic bags and bottled water in, in foreign countries, I, I, you know, at the end of the day, you're really only going to hurt um, probably the poorest amongst us. So when you, when you admonish us to go out and be real, make sure we're clear about what that means. Um, I, you know, like, I'm just taking issue with that a little bit. Uh, listen, I, 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 no, I'm, I'm, I'm 100% behind you. I mean, ironically, though, we see more leadership in developing countries over banning plastic bags than we have in this country. Kagami in Rwanda, in Mumbai, you know, I mean, you, the list goes on and on. So, you know, you've, you, you know, I, you know, what I'm not advocating is that you cut off, you know, clean source of drinking water to people at all. And in fact, what you'll see more and more in developing countries is that actually it's resource management. So, you know, locals will go out and grab bottles off the street and reclaim them to build stuff, to turn them into, you know, new materials. I've seen some of the most ingenious schemes going on in, in slums around Guatemala where you've got people taking plastic bottles, putting sand in them, building houses and earth rendering over them. Right? So inevitably, you know, it's it, like any issue that we deal with, it's got to be looked at locally as well as with a global perspective. So I'm, I don't think that I'm advocating that we, you know, there's going to be a global ban on bottled water. Um, you know, plastic bags, I still can't see how they, you know, um, help the environment. I can get your point about the trees, but I think if we were to choice edit both paper and plastic out, you'd see an innovation rate around new material bags coming out. You know, companies like Chico Bag, who are c concurrently being sued at the moment. Chico Bag are being sued, 
Right? You have a chicken bag, or you're suing chicken bag? Yeah. <laughs> so, so can you tell, tell so, people what chicken bag? Yeah. So, so chicken bag. I mean, there's been so there's been chicken chicken bag is these reusable bags that you can carry with you, and you can you know reuse them, um, and they're convenient. <laughs> um, and so there's been there's been a number there's a court case going on at the moment about basically freedom of right and and the fact that they're promoting a reusable bag over plastic bags, and I think that's the that was the basis of the court case. And then there was some information put out about the fact that E. coli was found. So the, you know, the industry took a piece of meat and chucked it inside a reusable bag, left it for a day, and said, yes, there's a high level of bacteria in reusable bags versus plastic bags. If you want to be healthy, use plastic bags. You know, I mean, there's a whole load of misinformation. So, no, listen, I, I, I totally agree with you that, you know, that there is, you know, a, a local, um, you know, analysis that needs to be done at all levels. But, you know, I can, you know, to go to bottled water and think that the number one selling product in Whole Foods is bottled water, right? It's nuts. It's crazy. So those, you know, and, and we're, you know, if we can't even get, you know, our own house in order, how do we expect to go and lecture other countries about how they should be doing stuff? So I think, you know, we have to take a global view, but I think we also have to be very real right now, today, and, you know, I mean, and, and start taking these challenges. And I think, it, you know, it's the challenge of ego. Let's start playing cities and towns off each other. Let's start playing leaders off each other. Let's create narratives that say, hey, you know what? Telluride just banned the plastic bag. Why haven't you done it? Oh, Aspen wants to do it now. Great. Now they get into a competition. Right. So, that's I think you bring up the great point of you really need to understand what is the alternative before you stop using plastic bottles. As long as we don't procrastinate, because we've got so many reports sitting on shelves telling us the pros and cons from both sides, and we have to also keep moving and acting. I'm sorry I have to say that, but I just see reports the whole time. It's in the back. You have to use a microphone. We're taping the, the conversation. Sorry. Yeah, thank you for your comments. Uh, Morgan Williams, I, I run a research institution down in Carbondale, an arid bioenergy production. Uh, thank you very much for, for this panel. I'm, I'm curious if there can be more comment on this single-use economy that we have here. Um, you know, I come to many of these events and I get all sorts of reusable bottles and reusable bags and they're literally piling up in my, in my house. And, and you, talk, you, talk, you alluded a little bit to social engineering with the smoking ban in, 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 in New York. And I'm wondering what it would take to ban, even in a form like this, any plastic or reusable product. I, I, I mean plastic or, or, or disposable product and just had to carry them around. What, what your thoughts are on that moving forward? I mean, I don't, in, in a form like this, I don't know that it would take very much and, and <laughs> uh, or that it should take very much. And, you know, we're seeing bans on, on plastic bags um, or single use products around the world more and more. Um, and, it, you know, I sometimes question whether that's the right choice because if they just sort of disappear, do consumers really understand what's going on? If they're maybe priced appropriately, does that offer a little bit more information to consumers? I'm a big believer in market mechanisms. I'm trying to implement a cap and trade program in California. Um, and, you know, I do believe that that consumers respond to prices, particularly in an instance where something was free before. So why was it free? And you've seen around the world uh, a few cents here and there for grocery bags has reduced within a few years by, by 80, 90 percent. Um, and, and so I do believe that, that appropriately pricing um, single-use products would help significantly. Um, in places where that's not possible, like in San Francisco, they, they've done a, a bag ban altogether. Um, and that has that has led to a number of innovations around reusable bags as well. Uh, but again, I, I because I do believe in market mechanisms, I, I do think there's a huge role for policymakers, um, which in a lot of ways, uh, I, I understand that businesses can only get so far out in front of policy uh, before it's sort of not sustainable for them. And so there is a bit of a give and take there. And I think, you know, it all begins with us as a consumer. You know, this is an environmental forum. And so each of us could have made the choice to bring our own drinking bottle from home or use the one that was provided to us and not use the uh, either the glass that has to be washed with energy and water or, or the disposable. So it starts with us. Uh, we have to make smart choices, smart choices, back to your comment. Uh, Lots of people in Pakistan and many places around the world depend on that bottled water to have safe drinking water every day. Well, if you, uh, a statistic, uh, eight gallons worth of water takes about two pounds of plastic to carry. To carry that same amount in glass, it would be about 30 pounds of glass. Well, that costs more in shipping. It costs more in energy to get it back and forth. It's a lot harder for people to carry around. It would break when they drop it. So. 
We have to think about the pros and the cons and alternatives and proper use of proper plastic in the proper situations, starting with individuals making the right choice. To just answer your thing, I mean, I just came over from the Telluride Film Festival, and they they had banned everything. So everyone was walking around using, going, "Oh, my fingers! I can use that," you know, and 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 oh yeah, I can use, I can drink out of the tap. Awesome, you know, like, <laughs> so it it did work. Um, and and just to go back, sorry, the thing on the Chico bag, I really recommend you guys go and have a look at his website, you know, because he's really struggling. But you know, this guy is a super cool guy. He started an awesome business, and he's getting nailed by big. You know, plastic industry, ACC, everyone's coming after him. And, and I, I remember what it was. The, the lawsuit started because of, of, of a statistic that he had quoted, right? A statistic that he had quoted, that he, the source of which was National Geographic and UNEP, right? And he, it was an EPA, an EPA, right, sorry, UNEP, EPA. And he had, he had cited this, you know, this statistic of 100 million seabirds killed every year. And in fact, it was every four years. When, you know, so it's 25,000 seabirds every year. And there's, you know, as I said, I mean, I joke about it, the statistics, but there are, the statistics vary massively. So he had been using some of this, and he'd been making comparisons about plastic bags to reusable bags and the fact that they were killing seabirds. And so they came after him for misinformation. And they've started suing him. And the same thing happened. I think they went after the, the city of Oakland as well. They gave up and went, you know what, we're going to just keep with the plastic bag. We don't have the funds right now. So just if you get a chance, maybe go to the Chico bag and check it out. Sorry for the plug for him, but I just feel he needs it. <laughs> Oh, sorry. He's got it, and then we'll take that. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> my name's Mark Gold, and I run a um, excuse me <clears throat> marine conservation group and pollution prevention group called Heal the Bay. Um, so as you can imagine, I'm definitely looking at this from the standpoint of what the impacts are to marine life. And so I don't care what life cycle analysis anybody does on single-use plastic bags, marine life gets screwed. Um, and that's, that's really the big problem here. Um, and so the, the question that I've seen is that, you know, so we've had this situation where the environmental community, yes, there's been a lot of battles in the legislature over things like bisphenol A and phthalates and what the health, health risks are on more durable plastic goods. But in this particular issue, where we're talking about single-use plastics, um, and, and notwithstanding, you know, obviously a new burgeoning research field on what the chemical impacts are um, on, on wildlife and, and human health, but the real impact that we've seen on marine life. What we've seen is a demonization of plastic that I think is unfair. What you brought up originally um, um, from the DuPont perspective on durable plastic goods, um, it, you know, that's not where the environmental community is going after. You know, I'm sitting here with a shirt with plastic buttons and, you know, I mean, none of us um, around this room, you know, I don't think has a huge beef on durable plastic goods. It's the single-use plastic packaging that lasts for a millennia in, in, in the environment um, but has a useful life of an hour that's actually the, that's the big opposition. Now, we've seen, as, as we've seen, millions of dollars have gone towards um, uh, litigation, opposition, turning turning around Seattle's 20 cent fee on plastic bags, another one just to add to your, to your long list, um, David, um, is that are, are, what do you, when you see the ACC really gear up on this, I think it's really hurting um, companies like yours that are producing durable plastic um, uses that, you know, goods that last for decades what are you guys talking about internally from the standpoint of you're not a single-use plastic, you're not a t-shirt bag manufacturer, you're not um, doing single-use plastic bottles, those sorts of things, or clamshells. That's, not, that's coming out of DART, that's coming out of a whole bunch of different folks. What are you guys doing to try to change the ACC's mindset on saying, look, you know, this is going to start damaging our core business that's so important um, to so many different people, saving lives in the medical industry, et cetera, et cetera. What are you doing on that? Because frankly, I think the pendulum has really gone to the point where public opinion is almost anti-plastic. That's, that's a great point. And again, I can't speak for the ACC, but I, I will say the ACC is doing a lot of good programs to help this issue in terms of uh, sponsoring recycling initiatives, sponsoring initiatives around reclaiming, uh, getting behind companies in the value chain who are trying to do the same. But we can't recycle our way or educate our way to a solution to the marine debris crisis. It just, we, we have 19, as an example, 19 billion plastic bags in the state of California. 
the best recycling program you're ever gonna see is two thirds, you'd still have six billion left over. So, I mean, we can't recycle our way to a solution when, when marine debris, it doesn't fit the life cycle analysis from the standpoint of, of greenhouse gas emissions. It's something that's, that's there wreaking havoc ecologically for, you know, literally centuries. But, I mean, I'll say, frankly, it's not gonna take groups like mine that are gonna have the impact. It's gonna take the corporations like yours that have so much at stake um, to really get some of these other um, groups, the smaller groups that are manufacturing this, to really clean out their act. And that's that's what we're missing in this dialogue. It's a pretty good point. I like it. <laughs> good morning. Todd Bailson from the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society in Philadelphia. Uh, I know very little about this, so I just have to refer to that article two weeks ago about the three dimensional printer in the New York Times, which I think is really creative and cool, but would also involve, I guess, a lot more plastic being printed. But you could see, like, you know, transportation totally changing, and I think it's also would create deep, uh, you know, innovation in our society. So your thoughts on that, uh, the pros and cons. Thanks. I, I would say it comes down, obviously, to the materials um, that are being used and, and how we look at, you know, we're very good at, you know, Bill McDonald and those guys created monster hybrid, you know, um, coined the phrase monster hybrids. You know, and that's what we do is we mix a lot of our plastics together to give them durability, to give them, you know, strength um, that they last forever and ever and ever. And I think, you know, um, or, or at least that's, <laughs> they, they should last forever and ever and ever. Sometimes they don't. And I think what, what we... Um, need to do is look at the materials that potentially those printers would be using. And I think if, if somebody could print themselves a bucket to then go and you know, use it to get themselves water, then it's fantastic. But at the end of the life cycle, what happens to it? So I think if we could create this closed loop system, and I know there's this is the vision of, you know, I've been speaking to some apparel companies recently. Their vision is exactly that, to take a shoe, make it out of modern materials that you can take out, you can put into a shredder, it shreds it up, and then it reprints your shoe using the materials before. You know, and, and I think if you can sort of look at those materials um, and, and, and apply them in the right way, and there's a right reclamation process, and I think there's a positive. But I'm also, same with you, man. I, I sit there and I go, we're going to print a lot more junk. It's like, oops. How many times, you, you know, you print something, you're like, oh, oh, I made a mistake on that one. I'll try and print it again, you know, and it could be a real mess. So. Well, I, I would just add, I mean, the 3D printers is part of a larger maker community that's really doing some interesting stuff. And, and there, I think there's a lot of opportunities as people start to realize what goes into manufacturing. There's also opportunities to think about lean manufacturing or, or you know, and, and, and the more people are making local um, products, it's less transportation, less cost. So there's other things that come with it despite more stuff. Um, one thing we've explored in some of my day job is the idea of upcycling, so taking some of the things from the waste and remanufacturing them for small products. We took Altoid boxes and etched on them and sold them as little jewelry cases. So there's small micro businesses, and I actually came across some in Africa where they took plastic bottles and made like sconces with it. So the maker community, the 3D printing, I think creates opportunities for that. So. Uh, Sorry. I am here as a spouse, but and I do the grocery shopping in our house. <laughs> I use plastic bags because I know that paper takes up a lot of space in our local landfill. The only thing I use paper shopping bags for is holding my newsprint recycling. Um, why, has, why have shopping bags been fixed on as this large symbolic issue when no one attacks plastic garbage bags that everyone uses in far greater volume and will never give up? Well, well, why, why aren't you recycling your paper shopping bags? Why would I you be put, sending them to a landfill? I, I'm not. I use them to hold my recycling. Oh, all right. Then they're not going to a landfill. That's, that's a good use of it. Yes, yes. Okay. But I'm asking why are, why are the, the incredibly cheap to produce and incredibly flimsy plastic shopping bags being demonized when the much greater use of much more durable plastic in garbage bags, actual garbage bags, no one ever talks about. And no, I, I would be much, much harder to convince the affluent to give up plastic garbage bags than, than to give, give, up, give up shopping bags. Right. Shopping bags are easy to replace. Can you I, can use a cloth one. Can I ask her a question? Can I, can I, can, is that okay? Yeah. I have a question. Name me something you've bought in the last week that's not recyclable. Uh, I haven't shopped in the last. Or month. in the last <laughs> month, maybe, maybe something in the in the last month that you've bought that's not recyclable. 
I honestly don't know. I, yeah. I do. I don't. I live in an extremely small town. I do most of my shopping through Amazon. Okay. So m most of what you purchased in the last month is actually recyclable. Most of what we buy as consumers in our everyday lives is actually recyclable. Most of what we buy is paper, uh, a number one and number two plastic, okay, aluminum or glass. Most of what we buy is actually recyclable. And the reason I'm bringing that up is you're absolutely right about these large trash bags that we have in America. We're probably the only country that actually has these huge, massive garbage bags because really most of what you're buying is actually recyclable. It should be going in a large recycling container that you have outside your home. And your garbage container should actually be really small because you actually have a really small amount of garbage. Understood. I understand that. And I compost. I do all the stuff. I'm just asking why people aren't going after glad bags, which all they do is get stronger. I, I think I think they will, and they're starting to. And I think what we have to do is we have to basically create a hierarchy, low-hanging fruit, right? So there's, you know, there needs to be a, a change in, in, in obviously, I, I agree with you, the plastic bags, and we're seeing now a lot more ones that are made from 100% recycled post-consumer plastics. They're being biodegradable ones, whether you agree with that or not. Um, you know, but there is a, there is a movement on that. But you have to think that the the actual reclamation, the process of getting that garbage out, and as you, as I just alluded to, you can you can minimize your waste down to nothing. But I think you will see that happen. But I think that's also like you know let's let's stage our wins. Let's win something. Let's create some change, and change inspires change. So if we can ban plastic bags, I think we'll. Have yeah, that's what I was going to say. That's yeah, you don't fly away as much. I mean, you know, you look at there's a very funny video. It's not funny, but it's actually well, it's quite funny online at the moment about the life of a plastic bag, and it's done in a very humorous <laughs> way, which is Heal the Bay. <laughs> exactly. Well, so and, it's, and, no, it's brilliant, and it's and it's you should go and watch it. But I mean, it's you know, yeah, so that's a good I, that's a good answer. Yeah, I would just add. I mean, it, that's exactly right. It's it's not necessarily something that that lands in the ocean. It's not something that you just get for free. Um, and, and it's it's within an hour's use. So I think there's a very, very different use pattern for plastic bags where, for plastic grocery bags or shopping bags, where alternatives that you can have with you in your car when you drive to the grocery store are very readily available as opposed to a big garbage bag. I just want to add to... This is my question because this is my spouse. I was just going to add to... <laughs> my spouse of a spouse. It's another 35 years ago you could smoke in your hospital bed in Boston and nurses would empty your ashtray. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I have a question for Marsha, which is that if you were standing in the 1970s and knew only what was going to happen with plastic automobile parts, you go, wow, cars are going to get really small and really light. Uh, what happens? What are the, there are these unintended consequences to making things smaller and lighter. Cars didn't get smaller and lighter for 20 years. Well, you know, actually, cars have gotten lighter over time. Uh, since the 1970s, there's been a tremendous amount of progress by the automotive engineers, by plastic companies like ourselves, in converting a lot of that metal to functional plastic that works just as well, in some cases better, because plastic doesn't corrode. Uh, and that has translated into measurably better uh, mile per gallon. Uh, in the 70s, I don't know if you remember, but the statistics say average mile per gallon was more in the 10 to 12 miles per gallon. Now, you know, we have cars like the Chevy Volt, which makes use of a lot of plastics. Most cars up to 50% plastic, only 10% of the weight. Uh, so again, that's helping drive the, the uh, carbon emissions equations, the gas mileage equation, and frankly, the cost to consumers like you and I. But it's really important to understand some of the other driving factors um, that have made cars lighter, more fuel efficient, and that has to do, again, with sort of trying to incorporate some full cost accounting of the cost of petroleum, the cost of greenhouse gas emissions emitted by less efficient vehicles. So I think that has really helped. And when you saw sort of a bit of stagnation over the last couple of decades on fuel economy, it was because there were no, there was no policy framework in place to require an increase in fuel, in car efficiency, and certainly no accounting of greenhouse gas emissions. That has now changed significantly. Um, and California is working with, with uh, the Department of Transportation and US EPA on those particular standards. But that has really pushed the market. I think it comes back to value. I mean, I could go back to the printer and the things, and we were talking about, I mean, and, and Ron's alluded to as well. I mean, it, we've got to just change the story. It's a value exchange that we've got to change. You know, the infinite potential of plastic, and, you know, it's been, all of us, I think, would agree with that. And, you know, to some, you know, that there is so much potential. It's just our understanding of the material and how we've misused it. 
so and I, I think you made a very good point about the fact that you know it'd be really interesting for DuPont as well as a maker to bring the other manufacturers together and say look it is damaging our reputation it's a brilliant point because plastic isn't the enemy it's ubiquitous it's going to be around forever we've got to learn to live with it otherwise it's going to continue to destroy our planet destroy our health you know at the rate it, which is just unsustainable and the whole word thermoplastic it, it, what it means is you can uh, melt and refreeze and melt and refreeze over and over again so we can yeah. reuse what we produce you know recycle uh, produce it into additional things that can be very valuable to us as consumers and at the end of life uh, dispose of it in the right responsible way uh, hi I'm Jacob chair of the Natural Resources Defense Council we've had a a lot of discussion today about the, the role of consumers and the choices they make, but I'd like the panel to talk a little bit about sort of responsibilities of producers and this whole move towards sort of extended uh, producer responsibility for the 60 billion tons of, of uh, uh, plastics that are being uh, put into our environment every year. So I, 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 I think extended producer responsibility is probably the most effective way to actually enact this change. And so uh, just to give everybody an example of what you're referring to, uh, at a high level, a government would say, uh, Industry X, you've sold 100 of these products. Um, we expect 80 of them to show up at the recycling facility, and we'll record them. Uh, 20, people could be reusing them, they could have disappeared, we don't expect 100%, but we do expect 80% of this to show up at the recycling facility. If only 75 of them show up at the recycling facility, we're going to assume that that 5% must have gone to the landfill, and therefore you will be responsible for paying that bill. We, the government, or we the people, are not going to pay for that. You are responsible for closing that loop. And I think extended producer responsibility, which you've seen grow in Europe, the best example is probably in the United States where there's a 7% tax on electronic in California that pays for e-waste systems is probably the most important movement, in my opinion, to get this loop closed. What I found is, unfortunately, most industries start off hiring lawyers and lobbyists to fight extended producer responsibility as opposed to sitting down with NRDC entrepreneurs and saying, this is how much we were going to spend on the lawyers and lobbyists to fight this. <laughs> what could you do with this money to actually find, and here's the key, a proactive business solution to closing this loop? So I, I think uh, that's the key to tying this all together. And as a producer, maybe I'll, <laughs> I'll speak up. Uh, many producers like DuPont are very sustainable, and we certainly have had a mission of sustainable growth for many years. You know, we started the journey in the 70s and 80s meeting regulations, and then very quickly went beyond that to setting very, very stretched goals around what we use of our own energy and our own processes, the greenhouse gas emissions, and then uh, most recently in the 90s and beyond, we've set 2015 and beyond sustainability goals to not only improve our own footprint, to Im but to improve the footprint of the value chains we serve. And that includes people who use our plastics, like the automobile companies and other people, and working together with those value chains, because it's not just one company's responsibility, but it's the whole value chain of using plastic and other things in a smart way designing for assembly and disassembly, uh, setting up the recycling infrastructure and network, having the science and technology to do something with it once you collect it so that it can be valuable again and be used in those or different value chains. So we take producer responsibility very, very seriously and I think many other people in the value chain do as well. So we're gonna have to wrap it up. Thank you um, everyone for coming. Thank you, panelists.